All right. Um, Scott, thank you so much for being here. Now, you have a solid Twitter following and you're active on social media, but my experience with you was very recent and it was at the T3 Framework and Edu Protocols Academy. And, and normally with guests, I don't really do like origin stories and dwell on that. I invite listeners to, to find you interesting and do some research based on that new interest. But in this case, your story or your, your path to teaching really fascinates me because you didn't go into teaching right out of college. What did you do before you became a public school teacher? So that's a great question. I want to start <laughs> off with two kind of caveats. One, uh, I think uh, my, my wife, my children, and many of my students would ca uh, caution anybody who's, uh, anybody who's going to research me that I'm not very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very boring and I talk too much. Uh, those are the constant criticisms I get. Uh, two, um, I, I want to credit my friend Liz Ramos for getting me onto Twitter because, you know, 10 years ago I was working on my doctorate and I was convinced that I was doing very important, breaking, cutting edge work that surely the world would drop everything and read my academic research. Right. And what I learned is that, uh, no, no one reads your academic research. Right. Um, and then Liz dragged me onto Twitter after I finished that. And I think Twitter's actually kind of similar because yeah you might have a few followers and whatnot you tweet things out into the world and the world largely doesn't notice uh occasionally <laughs> you hear from one person that says hey i agree with this or i disagree uh but by and large you put yourself out there and it's one way uh, you know, most people don't interact with you on the social media. I do uh, love and treasure the few people we have. And I, we'll talk about the Edge of Protocols community. Um, what I like about being part of that group is it's like a cult-like following. And people actually do engage and say, wow, how did you do this? Can I try it? And there's yeah. a lot of great teachers that really share and kind of boost each other's morale. Up. I'm and new I, to I like it. That. And I have found it so supportive, so yeah. positive um and, it, and so if you can get a vibe you know off a of facebook group it, it, this one you definitely can it's been awesome yep so i would say uh, my origin story before becoming a public school teacher uh, i i want to characterize myself as kind of a normal person a normal teenage boy with attention deficit disorder and so school was uh, pretty easy for me and i liked it i either loved classes or hated them um, depending on how interesting they were. And I, I did fairly well in high school. And I, I actually moved from New Hampshire to San Diego for college. And I worked in the golf course business in, in San Diego. And it was a wonderful, wonderful environment. Great for being a college student because essentially I worked at this country club and I had a, a, an eight hour paid study hall. So while I was in college, I was just at the front gate. And if a member drove up, they had a sticker on their car and I pushed the button and let them in. And if they weren't a member, I hassled them and said, what are you doing here? You need to be rich to get in here. And, um, you know, after about seven, eight o'clock at night, I worked the three to 11 shift after about seven o'clock, no one came in. Uh, so I, it was a great environment. And, and what I kind of learned is that rich people, they're not the devil. They were very kind to me. They were very uh, nurturing and, and they wanted to know what I was studying and where I was going to school. And, um, you know, I, after I graduated from college, they actually gave me a job inside in the big clubhouse and they paid me a lot of money. And that was in the beginning of the uh, world where we were putting in point of sale systems and networking everything together. So I kind of learned how to network a point of sale system in a big environment. And that just led to all sorts of, uh, you know, other career options uh, at this time. This was before the uh, dot com boom. And if you could turn on a computer and use it, they just kept throwing money at you. Uh, so I was lucky to kind of fail upwards. And then, um, gosh, after about eight or nine years of working in the country club, uh, I, I, got, uh, I got a job up in L.A. because I wanted to be in the entertainment industry. And um, I wound up at the wonderful world of Disney in uh, Burbank, Glendale. And I was uh, in their research and development lab and for, for the Imagineers for several years. And 
that was a great time. Again, this was kind of pre the dot com boom, and at that time we had two hundred and twenty people and thirty seven lab uh, in uh, four different labs all over the country. And Disney had this really wonderful model of, of an interdisciplinary approach to everything. So they'd throw a computer engineer, an electrical engineer, and an optical engineer, and a graphic designer, and all those people together, and you'd have to create the magic, make something better, faster cheaper. And so it was a really engaging and stimulating environment to be in. And I honestly thought I would never leave that job. It was the best job ever because I was constantly learning new things. Uh, but then the dot-com boom happened like around 2001, 2002. And we went from 220 employees down to 37. And then it became, well, don't ask for a raise, just shut up and be grateful you have a job because now you have to do Alfredo's job and Tom's job and Bill's job too, because they're not here anymore. And, and be grateful that you're working for the name Disney. It, and, and I went to high school in Burbank. I know exactly where you were, mm -hmm. you know, and I have a bunch of friends in, in, in that industry, which is why the next piece of your story is interesting to me, but um, so, yeah, and, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and I loved it and it was bittersweet to leave, but my, my wife and I had just gotten married. I don't think we were expecting our first child yet, um, but we were talking about children and uh, this, this all happened kind of late for me. I think I was 33 when I got married. 37 with the first kid and 40 with the second kid. So definitely what we, you would call a late bloomer. Um, and uh, when I told my wife I wanted to transition into education, she was very upfront. She's like, look, I, I hate teachers. I didn't like them when I was in school. I don't like them now. I don't want to spend time with teachers. Uh, and um, she has consistently um, said things like, you know, teachers are like cab drivers and psychologists. Your meter is always running. All you do is you talk about your work and your students. You, nothing else is important. And I just don't want to hear about it. So we, we set some ground rules and made some boundaries. And, and now when she gives me the hand, I know it's time to stop talking about my day and ask her about hers. So, right. um, but, uh, you know, I, I transitioned into what was called the LA Teaching Fellows Program, uh, and they were trying to attract what was called mid-career professionals that wanted to become teachers. And so uh, it was through UCLA. I think we both attended our credentialing at UCLA, right? Um, and it was a, a nice program where once you were accepted into the program, you got into the UCLA credential program, and then LAUSD said, we'll give you a job here at this school. And I have, uh, gosh, this was 20 plus years ago. I have worked in three, uh, two middle schools, three high schools. Uh, I'm going into year 20. It's my 10th year at Kennedy. And what I'll say is I, I liked about teaching is even though I had kind of wanderlust when I was younger and wanted to try new things and learn new, new ways, every seven or eight years, I'd switch jobs. Well, with teaching, you pretty much get to do that every year. Every year you get a new flock of kids. And if you don't like teaching world history, you can say, hey, to my department chair, I want to teach U.S. history next year. I don't want to teach AP anymore. I want to teach this AP class. You know, yeah. you can you can 100%. spice up your own life as much as you want. So it's not the same thing every year. And it definitely satisfies the a cerebral cortex for uh, young ADHD people like me. And, and one lens I'd, I'd like to weave in here is, you know, if there's people out there that are, that have friends who are mid-career and pandemic or recession or any combination of that uh, has hit them and they're, they're looking for their next thing and you think they'd be a great teacher, you know, uh, there are some people out there who didn't, you know, go to college with this dream right. of teaching that can really, really bring a lot to the table and we'll, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about what, what you bring, but, but um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, I, I'm kind of wrestling with this idea, like, do, do, do the experiences I had in the business world, how did they mold me? Did they make me a better person, a better teacher? Um, and I don't really know the answer to that. I know we're, we're more than the sum total of all our experiences, and I hope that your experiences make you better as you grow. Um, 
in the private sector, you know, uh, what I would say was very interesting about working at Disney or like, let's kind of compare the two. So in the country club business, you have a general manager who's the president of the country club that runs everything. And usually that person evaluates you and decides whether or not you're getting a raise or how much of a raise. In a corporate America like Disney, they had kind of a 360 evaluation process. So you get to pick a couple of coworkers and they evaluate you. Okay. And then your boss picks a couple of other coworkers that he doesn't tell you about and they evaluate you too. And they're trying to look at, hey, is Alfredo nice or is he a schmuck and only, you know, nice to the people he likes? Right. Um, and then how do everybody else have experience working with you? Do you turn your stuff in on time when you say you're going to? Are you holding up the team? Are you positive? Are you negative? And they take all that stuff into view. And what I would kind of argue is when you work for a company like Disney, they want to keep you long term and they want you to fit into their company culture. So they do a lot of, of team building and training on how do you learn uh, to be a good team player and things like that. And there's a lot more emphasis on collaboration and interdisciplinary work than there is, ironically, in education, where I think it's needed most. And I, I would argue that if, if I was working with the math teachers and the foreign language teachers and the science teachers instead of just the social studies teachers, I'd probably be a better teacher. But, <laughs> but most of my PD is just focused on the other social studies teachers. And, you know, social studies teachers, they can't agree on anything. You know, it, yeah, it's, it's tough. And, and they, they really guard their independence and autonomy, mm -hmm. and uh, which I, I can respect, but uh, sometimes we got to put the, the kids first in the conversation, right? Are we putting the kids first here when we decide we're not all going to have uh, the same this or that? And, and, oh, gosh, you know when a veteran teacher uses the phrase lockstep. Oh, so we're all going to be in lockstep? You know the conversation. Right. Over. You know the conversation's yep. over. Bye -bye. <laughs> yep. so it's, it's like, okay, I, I, I don't know that we're having the, the same conversation. But you've had plenty of years of teaching and and – and some years in the in the private sector was was your professional non teaching experience an asset or a liability? Do you think um, in the classroom? I think it, it's definitely an asset because you learn quickly that there are different stakeholders, and all those stakeholders mm -hmm. actually have an impact on uh, your job or your satisfaction with your job. So um, in, in the corporate environment, there's more of an emphasis on if, if we're not happy and this team's not functioning, someone needs to change. And guess who it is? It's you. So how are you going to change for the benefit of this team? And you don't see a lot of people that cling to that isolationist dogma in the corporate world or if they, they don't last very long, maybe. That was my experience. Um, uh, and, and I found a lot of people like, you know, they learn to be well-rounded. They learn to be trustworthy. And I do think uh, it's important to have a little ageism in here. You know, 20-year-old Scott is a lot more considerate of other people and their opinions than, say, 40-year-old Scott was. And I think there's a number of factors that help that. A, your age and experience. Um, B, your experience with relationships. You know, like I, I've been lucky to be married for 20 plus years. And, you know, the one thing you kind of learn early on is do you want to be right or do you want to stay married? Right. And so there's a lot of things that when my wife and I are disagreeing, I'm just going to give her, give it to her. I'll give her the win. She gets what she wants and we'll both move on because I'm not dying on this hill of, do I put the butter back in the refrigerator or do I leave it on the counter? I, hear you. I need to learn how to put it in the refrigerator. <laughs> uh, what do you think is the most unique or important thing that you believe someone transitioning to uh, teaching? who's coming into teaching from the private sector brings to the classroom. Oh no, you hiccup there for a second. Oh, Can you hear me? me? Okay. I don't know if that was my internet, but you, you hiccup okay. a little bit. So, so transitioning into teaching from the private sector. Yeah. Gosh, you really you have bring in that a kid who went right into right to college and then right into credential program and then right into teaching isn't going to bring potentially. 
So I, I would kind of argue patience. Um, you know, if you have been working in a couple of different fields, you kind of assess, when you assess the lay of the land, you realize that there are people who are better at this than I am. There are people that have more experience, they're more decorated, or maybe they're just naturally gifted in a certain area. And wow, it's amazing working with them. Um, so uh, when you get in, especially like most of the teaching credential programs, they're usually cohorted. So you're, if you're a part of a cohort, you're in with an, another group of 20 year olds and you're all taking the same classes together and you're all having the same type of field experiences. And you all usually have debriefing sessions with like a teacher mentor who's probably 20 or 30 years older than you. Mm -hmm. So it's a very homogenous experience. You don't get that experience in the business world. There's just, you know, in education, the average age of a teacher is about 42. Um, you know, 72% of us are white, I think, and uh, the rest of us are people of color. It's a pretty homogenous group. Um, so I, I would say teaching by and large, and, and you can argue semantically about teaching in a city versus teaching in a rural area, uh, but the demographics are pretty similar coast to coast. And I, I actually think, and this is just my personal viewpoint, that I am a much better teacher in my mid thirties than I would have been in my early twenties. Uh, I would have been more focused on me, 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 and more focused on my nightlife and my social life and my, you know, relationship with, uh, you know, building relationships and networking than I, in my twenties than I was in my thirties. Now when I'm in my thirties and I'm newly married and I'm thinking about having kids, you know, I, I was more focused on the career and I wanted to get better at the career. And what I found in my transition to teaching was as part of you moving up the salary table ladder in LAUSD or any large organization, you have to take these classes, salary point classes or take college credits. And so that's why I went back to school for my master's and my doctorate, because I needed to earn those college credits to move up the salary table and to make what I would argue as a living wage in Los Angeles. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a different, different deal. And so I just, I put that goal up and I said, okay, I need to get 15 units per year to move up to the next level and get myself a raise. And for the first five to 10 years of teaching, I just dogmatically worked towards moving up the ladder. Um, I've met lots of teachers that never moved up the ladder and they've been teaching for 10 or 15 years and they're still only making like 50,000. And I wanted to get to the top and max out my salary because otherwise I felt like I'm just giving that money back. And believe it or not, I took a considerable pay cut when I left the private sector and became a teacher. So, and it took me about 10 years to get that pay cut back. Well, I believe it. Yeah. Uh, I, I was in um, teaching uh, was not my first job out of college either. Um, which is another reason why I really identify with your story. I was in dot coms in uh, the late nineties, early two thousands. And I just kept getting fired every five to eight months. And I'd get a check, you know, for mm -hmm. six or seven months worth and right. do nothing and then jump into another one and then feel really good about it and get promised all this stuff like stock options. And then they would shut down. And uh at one point I, you know, got fired and had this check I'm looking at and it was July. And I said, man, what do I, I don't, I don't enjoy this. Um, what do I, what do I really want to do? And I just spent some time really thinking about it. And I, I you know, I did want to be a teacher when I was in high school. I got, I got away from it due to, Hey, all kinds of situations, including thinking it didn't pay a living wage for Los Angeles. Um, but I had this little cushion and I went back to teaching and, and but I knew to, get those extra units. Yeah. And, you know, when you talk to um, the younger teachers that are coming in, for some of them, it's a real hardship to do the student teaching. Yeah, it's with, free. We don't yeah, get paid. They're, <laughs> yeah, they're giving their work away for free. So I, I think there's, you know, a lot of research that points towards this sort of uh, internship model, like they use in the medical field, where you're, you're getting paid for your internship, but you're also being supervised and mentored to be better. Because I, I think most people, and myself included, 
I felt like I was a horrible teacher the first five years. I felt like I was constantly failing. I was teaching middle school. They were rabid squirrels. There were like 42 of them against me. And they just wear you down. And there's more of them than there are of you. And just getting through that day became more and more difficult. And I was lucky. I had a wonderful UCLA teaching mentor. His name was Kent Lewis. And he was a giant of a man with a shaved bald head. He looked like Mr. Clean. And I remember the first time he came into my classroom, I told the kids he was my probation officer. And oh my God, they all were like, you know, deer in the headlights and speechless. And they, oh, they were on their best behavior when Mr. Lewis was visiting. Yeah, the fact that they believe that is awesome. Um, all right, well, would you recommend teaching to someone affected by pandemic and recession looking for a professional change like, like you did? So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, that's a great question, Alfredo. Um, you know, I think it really depends on your personality and what are you looking for in a career? Um, I, you know, knew I wanted to have children and Adam Moeller, my co-author from Social Studies Edu Protocols, he and I were just talking about this night, the idea that teaching and parenting is a symbiotic relationship, that from parenting, you learn more patience and you learn to be kinder to children because they're yours and you're responsible for their upbringing. And then having that experience as a pattern, a parent probably makes you a better teacher in that you look at these 42 little rabid squirrels in front of you and you think, oh, that one is the light of somebody's life. Yeah, that's so somebody's kid. I can't call them a moron. I can't be a sarcastic yeah. jerk. Uh, my job is to coach them up and make them better at whatever they're doing. So, um, and I, I want to credit, you know, I had a lot of people along the way because I am a jokester and a sarcastic jerk. And that is just not the way to go through education. You really have to have that growth mindset and you really have to say, you know, my job is to help you figure out what are you good at and what do you like to do? And I was very lucky because I loved reading when I grew up. So school was very easy for me. And um, my teachers all loved me because I always loved to read and I loved to talk about what I was reading. So, you know, the hardest thing about being a teacher is when you go, any questions? And no hands go up except for the one kid who wants to go to the bathroom. And I always joke about how if they're ever going to make us teachers carry guns in class, look out for that kid who needs to go to the bathroom every period because yeah. he's going to be the first one to buy the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is a, a, a tough thing. You know, you don't want to end up giving all your attention to the kids that raise their hands, the, the few kids that do. Uh, but they're the ones giving you that, that energy that, you know, sometimes we're really, we're really looking for. And, and uh, the finding that balance is, is tough. So um, to kind of really get back to that question, and again, because I'm a LAUSD teacher, I haven't really been affected by the pandemic. And I've been very fortunate in my adult life where I haven't really been impacted by recession, except for the real estate bust. Um, but I've always had a job and I've always felt like if I don't like this job, I can get another job. And so I haven't had the same experiences that today's millennials and today's kids that maybe it wasn't easy for them to find a job. Uh, and maybe they're underemployed and not making what they think they should make and they're doing a job they hate. Uh, I've always been very, very fortunate to have jobs that I thought were intellectually interesting and stimulating and certainly jobs that had a, a path up. Uh, even now, I get five or six job offers a year uh, just because the word innovation is in my dissertation. And uh, I get people cold calling me asking if I'd like to work for their museum or their startup or their ed tech company or their school. Um, and, you know, part of that, I think, is from having the social media outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, I mean, I think a lot of it is j just based on the fact that I am a person who likes to try new things. And those people are kind of hard to find and they're always looking for them. That segues into my next question, I think, very, very much, uh, because we are in the middle of a teacher shortage, and uh, there we 
I mean, we're in August, the school year starting in different states and different districts are trying uh, a variety of ways to get people in there. So it's August 22, uh, 2022. And, and what we're hearing and seeing is that there are teacher shortages in the thousands and different states are affected differently. I mean, we're in California. It's a little bit different. But the state of Florida is creating a pathway for military veterans to sign up and start teaching immediately if they have some college credits and served for four years. The governor of Florida said last week, and I quote, you give me somebody who has four years of experience as a devil dog over somebody who has four years of experience at shoehorn you. And I will make, I will take the Marine every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Do you think it's your experience that makes you the teacher you are, or do you think it's just in person, a person's inherent personality and values that makes them a good teacher eventually? Well, you know, I think it's both actually. And here's where I kind of uh, wave, wave the flag of caution about if we're going to look to our military for our future teachers. Um, military is usually very adherent to a chain of command and you're either following orders or you're not. Now, I don't know if you've taught middle school recently or what your high school <laughs> experience is like, but I have a lot of young people that don't want to follow orders in my classroom. And it's up to you to kind of through a combination of uh, your personality and your salesmanship and your art of persuasion, uh, are you going to get them to follow your routines and procedures or are you going to have a constant problem? And what I've kind of learned in my years of teaching is if you start an argument with a teenager, you have already lost. So uh, what I worry about these military people, they're not going to start arguments. They're going to start conflicts. You know, you're not following directions. So you're going to the brig or you're doing push-ups or whatever the consequences are. And the military world is very black and white. You follow orders or people die. Right. Uh, education, the stakes are very high yeah. and, and immediate. Ed education is less so. <laughs> um, right. and, and again, I think it's been my personality and my experience and a little bit of, uh, you know, grace that I've learned that, you know, yeah, if, if a kid is having some problems in my class, if a kid is having, uh, you know, they broke up with their girlfriend, they got into a fight with their dad, whatever that stuff is, you can treat that kid differently than the other 30 kids in your class because, you know, they're going through a crisis or trauma. And when you're a teenager, boy, emotions are raw and they change like the weather and change like that. And so if, if you're malleable and you focus more on empowering your kids to be better and more responsible students instead of enforcing your power over them, and saying, I'm the teacher, respect me, do what I say, I don't care what you think, uh, you're going to be set up for success a lot more than if you just keep going down, but you're, we're going to follow this chain of command or you're in trouble. Right. And additionally, when, when you were working at Disney and prior to getting into teaching, you, you did some writing. Mm -hmm. And um, you uh, and recently you took your writing talent and you merged it with education by collaborating on a book oh. and focusing on right <laughs> focusing on uh the edu protocol strategies specifically for um uh, middle school and high school social studies teachers what made you feel like a book with this focus was necessary so um wow uh so I, I want to start with uh, my, my first initial reaction is that the edge of protocols, especially during pandemic learning, during Zoom learning, I think saved my teaching career and where okay. a lot of teachers were just exasperated with the one way broadcasting that was happening with no reaction from the students, no feedback from the students, no work, no nothing. Uh, I was lucky because I was using it to protocols and all that feedback loop and collaboration and creativity is kind of built right in. Now, I'm not saying I didn't have kids disengage and I didn't fail students during the pandemic because I certainly did. 
But on the whole, because if you give somebody a deck of the Iron Chef, you see who's working in the deck and who's not. So I could say, hey, Alfredo, slide 13, how come you haven't started working yet? And I could send you a little message through Zoom. And I could, if, if you weren't answering my message through Zoom, I could pick up the phone and call your house. And I could get you back on task or find out that you had fallen back to sleep and you weren't coming back to class. Um, so while um, I had a lot of my colleagues that were just kind of bemoaning the fact that I was not, you know, their teaching was not effective anymore. Their teaching was not working and the kids were just giving up. Um, I, ha I heard a lot of that from my colleagues, but I did not experience that. I experienced kids talking to me every day, kids turning on their cameras and making an argument, kids presenting something every day. And that really, um, turned my whole teaching philosophy around. Uh, more of the, this is a coaching mindset. I'm going to help you improve. You're going to tell me where you think you need to improve. Um, but, you know, when you go back to writing talent, I kind of have this knee-jerk reaction. Anybody who talks thinks they're a writer, right? If you can talk, it's writing is just talking on paper. So, uh, in, in certainly all the writing I did over the course of my career, um, my, my joke used to be, if you're not getting enough rejection, humiliation, and pain from dating, you should try writing. And I worked in the entertainment industry where I had all of my screenplays consistently rejected by the mainstream Hollywood machine. Ironically, I wrote a book on screenwriting. I, I used to make a little bit of a living as a freelance writer before the dot-com thing started. Uh, and I had luck getting published and things like that, but it certainly wasn't enough to, to eke out a living. And then I'll tell you, I really was humbled when I went back to school to get my doctorate because I thought, oh, I'm a good writer and I've been a good, I've got my master's. I know how to be an academic writer. Huh, slap, slap, slap. I did not know. And it was a lot of uh, pain and humility learning how to kind of learn this new skill set of academic writing where you're synthesizing the idea of experts and nobody really cares about your opinion. It's what can you find in the empirical literature. That was a big struggle for me. And I still struggle in writing. Sometimes it takes me 500 words to get to the point. And in a lot of um, education writing, you don't have that kind of time. Yeah, I, I would, I would uh, argue that just because you can talk doesn't mean you can be a great writer. I appreciate your optimism, but <laughs> I, I tried to blog early on and just, I, I don't know, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't come as easily, but I can turn a camera on and have a conversation with anybody. But I am working on it. I am inspired by uh, what you're doing. You'll notice I'm in my classroom and my lights went off. Yeah, was, you got to love those motion detectors. That's huh? why I was sort of waving my <laughs> arms here. Let's see if I can get them off. Let yeah. there be light. Yeah. That's light. Uh, well, I will say there are people, you know, I've had a blog for many years and I always used it uh, and I, I did it after I finished my doc program. So I think I started it around 2012, 2013. And I really just used it to clarify my thinking. And then I found out that, oh, I have other people that think this way and now follow me and talk about what I'm writing about and what's important to me. So it was a good way to make connections with people who are struggling with grading or, you know, I'm a history teacher, but now I have to be a writing teacher. How do I do that? What are some strategies I can use? Um, but I'll, and, and I've kind of gone up and down. Like I used to really write monthly and publish everything to the blog. And then when I started working on the Edge of Protocols book, I just stopped. And I knew I was saving all my writing for the book. I wasn't going to do anything. And I'll tell you, my coworker, uh, Adam Moeller, he's got a, an amazing blog, uh, Ponderings from 105, Thoughts from Room 505. And he's, he's really uh, got it down where he has the purposeful, reflective teacher traits. He's very inspiring. He's going to try and I get started into skimming it, it yeah. Year, yeah, I started skimming it since that uh, – training thing we did and and he also just he came off like such a super good dude also and so yeah. i was skimming it and yeah he's 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 got a gift and so I'm, I'm inspired by you guys i was really i'm really grateful i've spent uh spent that time um so i read your book i highly recommend it to high school teachers especially ap history teachers like us um 
the national pass rate, I feel, especially for like AP Gov and AP History, is ridiculously low. Uh, did you know that through the pandemic, the pass rates remained steady? I saw a, a graph recently, which uh, what what is that kind of data? say to you that even during the pandemic, there was minimal change in the pass rates. That's very interesting. I thought, and this is just from my anecdotal experience talking to other AP teachers, um, I thought that the college board actually lowered the bar and I thought they passed more people during the pandemic than normal. In fact, a lot of the AP teachers I've talked to have said the last couple of years have been the best passing scores they've ever had. I saw a graphic and I would say the the margin or of change was very slight over from maybe two years before to this most recent year, which I I was having trouble kind of explaining. I'm a reader for uh, AP seminar right now. I read for AP Euro for four years. Uh, uh, but something like a push is a fifth is 50 percent. Right. It was 50% before the pandemic, it was 50% in 1982, and was 50% last year. Right. Nationally, you know. So, well, I have so many mixed feelings about the college board and the AP curriculum. Uh, on one level, I feel like it has created an arms race in public education where we're forcing more kids to take these AP classes. And then we're creating a lot of anxiety because kids believe, oh, I have to take five, 10, 15 AP classes to get into the college I want. And I've, I've had some kids who are taking six AP classes and a dual enrollment college class after school on top of that. And if you give them one more menial task, they're just gonna snap and jump off the roof. Um, so I am worried about, uh, are we loading these kids up and giving them stuff that is developmentally inappropriate? Uh, are we just loading them to a breaking point and then standing back and watching? And you see that kids react different ways. Some kids react to the challenge, jump in, and they do just fine. Some kids say, whoa, I can't do this, and they drop out of your class the second semester. Um, so it's, it's hard to generalize about everything, but I think AP is not for everyone. And I, I think if you look at, it's really only about 15% of the school population that takes an AP class. So uh, I have hesitancy about advocating it for kids who really don't want it, really don't need it. And I'm worried that uh, we're pushing kids that don't like it into it. And what's happening, if you look at the data, is less and less kids are interested in going to college. And if you look at the number of young people that are enrolling in college after high school, it's gone down like 12% in the last five years. So, um, you know, again, my personal experience, I liked school. I felt like I was good at school. I felt like my teachers liked me. Uh, I know a lot of kids that go from like a traditional honors class to AP and it's a whap. Yep. And they feel like they're failures for the first time in their life. And they feel like that teacher didn't like them. And they say, nope, I'm not taking another one. I'm out. And maybe I'm not going to a four-year college. Maybe I'll just go to a two-year and see if I like it before I really commit. Um, so, you know, I, do I think edu protocols can help AP teachers be less uh, demanding and front loading? I think the, the rap on AP has been, you know, if you take an AP class compared to a dual enrollment community college class, the AP class has five times the amount of work, five right. times the amount of reading, five times the amount of homework, five times the demands on the kids' class time. And like my 14 year old, Sammy, she took two college classes this summer. She hasn't even set foot in her high school yet. And she took a animation boot camp, a, cool. a 3D modeling class that she loved. And she took a storyboarding 101 for animators class that she loved. And she has signed up for three more LA City College animation classes. She's gonna take one this fall, one this spring and one next summer. And what they're doing is the animation class next summer is being taught at DreamWorks Animation 
And the other times it's not at DreamWorks, it'll be at Nickelodeon's animation Jeez. studios. Wow. So amazing. At, what an amazing a, opportunity. Exactly. So as a 14 year old that loves animation, she's totally jazzed. And I think if I put her in any AP class at the age of 14, she would have a totally different experience. Well, and we, they tell us because we have more motivated kids, uh, something like an edge of protocols series of strategies is maybe, uh, you know, not for advanced kids. And th there's this weird logic of because they're more motivated, curious, harder working and organized, uh, they can handle more lecture. Right. Uh. Right. And, and so, uh, gosh, darn it. Uh, th that, that logic is failing us. It's failing them. Uh, I don't know about your school's numbers, but my, my, I was talking to a counselor here as I've been getting ready to get back to, to school. And this counselor says we have the lowest number of, of students in AP classes. We're going to be having the fewest number of AP tests taken this coming spring. Uh, and the students are just saying, I, I don't want to stress myself out as badly as I have in the past. Like I, I know, and I've been, it's been reinforced that I need to manage my own situation mm -hmm. and my stress. And so I'd rather take two than four this year, right. which I'm really, I'm really proud of the kids at, at this campus for that. And I started to hear some of that when they were registering last February, like, Ooh, I don't know. We may have to sit that out. Yeah, I mean, this is a much larger question, and it goes back to: Do we really need 180 days for school? Right. Um, do we do we really need to assign four hours of homework every night in every class? Uh, and you know how resistant to change teachers are. Um, but before we get off this topic, I want to talk a little bit about um, Edu Protocol sequencing rack and stack and remixing, you know, John Carippo loves the hyperbole and loves the terms. Yep. But what, what I have found is as students get more familiar and, and competent with edu protocols, they can go deeper with rigor. And like using Iron Chef to jigsaw through a unit uh, helps the students at the beginning of the unit. And then it also helps them with their formative assessment at the end of the unit. And what I have found is um, if you use the Edge Protocol lesson plans, because kids get out what they put into it, if you've got a kid that's maybe not doing so much work at the beginning, by the end of the week, that has snowballed on him. And so like one sequence I did with my Harlem Renaissance unit is I had my kids do a little bit of research on one person in the Harlem Renaissance. So they had to use the research edge protocol, which is give me five sources on this person and tell me five interesting facts from each source. And can you do that in one class period? So read five sources, give me 25 facts. Most kids can do that. Uh, but then the next day they have to take those 25 facts scale it down to 10 facts, and they have to rate them on most interesting to most boring. Uh -huh. So can they organize or concept sort those facts within a framework? And then once they've got that organized, now they're going to write a little script telling you about that person and their contributions from the Harlem Renaissance. And then once you've written the script, can you record it in like a 30 to 60 second flip grid and make it interesting to the viewer or listener? And then what I do is I have the kids grade it on a scale of boring to interesting. So at the end, every kid listens to every audio track and they rate it. Was it interesting or boring? And you can say, well, Alfredo's was 79% interesting. Right. Like rotten Alf tomatoes. Exactly. <laughs> um, and it, so I think that's a way to, you really take those kids who are intrinsically motivated. They dive deeper into learning the content. They want to have that social capital with their friends and do a good job for making the video or making the audio because they know that the audience of their peers is going to be listening to it and they know they're going to get actionable feedback. They're going to get some feedback, whether it was good or whether it was 
not so good. So I think, yes, edu protocols can help AP teachers. There might be a learning curve of how do you sequence them because AP teachers are used to like grapes and aparts and all these, you know, uh, death by a thousand primary sources uh-huh. and just getting kids to write the uh, CCOT essay and, you know, DBQs. And that's personally what I worry about is uh, the a push class isn't as engaging to kids as the regular classes with the use of edge protocols. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I appreciate what you're doing. Okay. This is the book. Uh, it's in a series of edge protocols book. Um, I think your real world experience has, has contributed a bunch to uh, being the kind of teacher you are being an author, being a resource for us, um, and, and I think, uh, people should, should really check out the book and edge of protocols, whether you're high school or, or lower and whether you're AP or not. Um, this is a podcast about, uh, what does it mean? I'm just, a, I'm, you know, I'm not a guru. I'm just a guy trying to understand what does it mean to teach for justice? And so my, my final question as often as I can remember to do it for my guests is <laughs> for my guests is what does it mean? for you to teach for justice? I love it. That's a great question. So, uh, I mean, I have to acknowledge the fact that I'm a white kid who grew up in the state of New Hampshire, which is 99.99% white and has been throughout time. Um, But I want to say one of my formative experiences was moving to California and working with a large Hispanic community. I worked in the restaurant business when I first got here, and I had to learn to communicate with people who spoke mostly Spanish. And in the beginning, it was a lot of gestures, and and it helps when you're nice to people and you're doing your share of the work. And so, uh, you know, I learned very quickly that to succeed in a multicultural society, you have to be very tolerant of other people and their routines and procedures. So uh, now teaching in LAUSD, about 80% of my students are Hispanic. And uh, I have just kind of changed my curriculum so I can have more of that Hispanic focus. And what I will say, uh, one of my favorite books, you've heard me talk about this, is Patriots from the Barrio. It's a book by Dave Gutierrez that's about the only World War II division in uh, Mexican-American world division that fought in World War II. And they went over to Italy and they got sent through the meat grinder and they got slaughtered. Uh, I think 250 went over there and only about 30. 37 came back. And the kids love that book because they're kids that sound like them and have names like them. Uh, But if you ask kids before they get to that book, how many Mexican Americans participated in in World War II, they think zero. Right. Um, So the long and the short is I think, you know, you have to know your audience. And you have to be responsive to your audience. And for me, my sort of reason for being a teacher is I I want people to have the experience I had where they discover they like school, they're good at school, and they want to get better at what they like to do. So whether you're an artist and you like drawing, I'm going to give you opportunities to do that in my class. You're a talker like me. You want to do podcasts. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that in class. You're a writer. You want to write a children's book on every topic. You want to do the retail and rhyme and your protocol and turn everything into a rap. That's great. You can do that too. There are many ways to show your mastery. And what I'm finding is, you know, it's hard to empower kids to figure out what they like to do. There are so many kids that are just, eh, I don't care. Just let me get a C. Eh, I don't care. Just let me do the bare minimum. And uh, fortunately, whenever I use edu protocols and I tell the kids, you're going to create something, you're going to use the information you've gotten from these four or five edu protocols to create something. That's when I start to see, oh my God, they're exceeding my expectations. And like la- last year, a couple of years ago, during the pandemic, it was, I had the kids do children's books on women in World War II. And at the beginning of the unit, they didn't know any women who had served in World War II. And at the end of it, I think they'd created like 60 or so children's books. Oh, wow. And I got to use those children's books to have the next year's class 
read about these women and I had them do some fact checking activities. And that's kind of my dream, my long term dream, because I'm lazy and I don't want to work hard. (laughs) What I want to do is use the work my students create to teach next year's classes. Right. So that that's what I'm kind of on my mission just to use. And I I like any protocols because it makes the learning visible. It's there. It's tangible. You can give it to kids the next day and say, what did you learn from this? What did you think? Is this an A, B or C? And then just sit back and listen to their explanations. I had the experience one time of uh, where a student who had made a great PowerPoint, his younger sibling was in my class and I, I used the PowerPoint and the, got an email from the, alum, <laughs> from the alumni older brother. Yo, Silva, uh, my brother says you used my PowerPoint and he just, he felt really good about it. And his brother, his brother was like, yeah, my brother did that. Cause it was, it was super clean. These kids make better PowerPoints than I would. Yeah. Oh, they, to my own devices anyway. They totally do. I do not have that uh, graphic design gene. I was born without it. Well, listen, this wraps it up. I, and I just want to say thank you so much for all you're doing for teachers, but especially for us social studies teachers that are just want to be more effective in this changing time with these kids that are, you know, distracted by social media mm-hmm. and, you know, affected by all of these things. And, and as a teacher, I am too. But uh, I think if you're, if you're open to some new ideas or you're looking for a change to spice it up, um, uh, this Edu Protocols book for social studies is the field guide is, uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it and get, get some things out of it uh, that, that you can use right away. And, and just as a, as a human man, I appreciate you. And uh, uh, I'm grateful that you spent this time with me. Um, and I look forward to turning all this off and spending some time with you here in the new f- near future also. All right. Thank you, Alfredo. I appreciate all right. it. All right. Thanks. Thanks. I'll see you soon. Okay.